welcome to Brenda Perry, the Brenda Perryman Show right here on TV 33, WHPR, Comcast 20 in Detroit. And boy, do I have a show for you today. I have a friend of the show and a new friend of the show. We have real estate and we have entertainment today. And I think you're going to be excited. Uh, my second guest is Mr. Anthony Cuffey, filmmaker, educator, and you're going to enjoy him so much. And my first guest is a friend of the show, Mr. Reginald Perryman, who is a realtor. I promised when I had him on before that I'd have him back again to talk about real estate because we never finished our conversation. So um, good morning, Reginald. Good How mor are you? Good morning. How are you? Everybody asks, is, are you all related? Is that your son? Well, it's kind of like a cousin thing going on. So, um, and he is so knowledgeable. And what age did you start real estate? I started at age 19. 19. 19. So you've been in it how long now? It's been 21 years now. 21 years. Isn't that wonderful? And did you always have a passion for real estate? Yes, I did. Why? Pretty much my, uh, my grandmother was into real estate when I was younger. She was an investor. And I uh, picked up the interest from just watching her and being around her family okay okay so let's make sure you get close enough to the mic so we can really hear you so um, what I wanted to talk to you about today is number one people are always talking about real estate values in Detroit are the real estate values going up yes the property values are increasing in the city and surrounding suburbs pretty much because the banks are not listing as many properties as they were before. So there's not a flood of inventory. Actually, there's a shortage of properties on the market right now. You're kidding me. <laughs> no, I'm not. A shortage? Yes. Okay, let's talk about Detroit. What sections of Detroit are people kind of flooding to or buying to? Uh, in other words, years ago when I was looking for a house in Detroit, I wanted to move over in that Sherwood Forest yes. area, yes. a go a golf club area. I, I like that area yes. over there, or Rosedale Park. But are those areas still hot? Yes, they are. You're, you're talking about like Palmerwood, Sherwood Forest. Yeah, I couldn't. You notice I conspicuously <laughs> didn't mention Palmer Woods because right. I couldn't afford that. <laughs> but so, um, what parts are hot? Uh, Palmer Woods, Indian Village, uh, Rosedale Park, Sherwood Forest, University District. Those have always been the hotter areas of the city. But then you still have other areas, Grandmont, uh, Rosedale Park, those areas are well as well. What makes those areas so hot? Um, pretty much it's just the pride of ownership. Um, people are maintaining their lawns. The landscaping is up well maintained. People are keeping their properties maintained as well. Wow. Well, what about other sections of Detroit? Because there's some beautiful homes all over Detroit. Yes, they are. What about some other sections of Detroit? Or do you find a lot more foreclosures going on now? What's happening? Actually, so there's, there's less foreclosures. The, the banks are taking, they're not as aggressive as in foreclosing on properties anymore. Why so were they so aggressive then? Um, I, th I think they were just reacting to the market. They didn't expect it to affect them long term because if you go into any area three years ago you'll see 20 or 30 homes that were on the market now you may see four or five that are bank foreclosures now with the bank foreclosure say if someone's interested how do they know it's a bank foreclosure pretty much you just contact a realtor and they can tell you if the property is a bank foreclosure is that a good property to buy Yes, of course, because of the value you're going to get from the property. You're, you're paying below market value for most of your bank foreclosures. Really? But the competition is steep. Now, you know, it's common that if you're making an offer on a bank property or bank foreclosure, you, there's going to be multiple offers because there's not enough inventory. So usually the banks are going to ask for highest and best. Oh, really? Yeah, it becomes a bidding war. Now, do th those properties need... Uh, like repair or do most of them need repair you think or what it, it varies on a property I mean you, you of course you have some properties that have been vandalized 
but then you have properties that are in move-in condition as well. So each property varies depending on the situation. Okay. And one, one of the issues we have now, especially with bank foreclosures, are people are actually vacating their properties too early. They don't understand the full process. What, why don't you explain that to us? Because we hear about people walking away Correct. and stuff, and you're saying they're walking away too early? Exactly. So, for example, um, someone has is, is missed three or four payments on their mortgage. You have people that are walking away at that time not realizing that the bank has to go through the foreclosure process. After the sheriff's sale, there's actually a six-month redemption period in which the person can continue to live in a property. People are walking away before that six-month redemption period. you mentioned period. the sheriff. What, what do you mean by that? That's the sheriff's sale with the county. So after the property is foreclosed, then there's a sheriff's sale that occurs with the county. At that time, there's a six-month redemption period in which the owner has six months to redeem the property or sell it via short sale. And what happens is a lot of times people will just walk away from the property. That property will actually sit vacant for six or seven months. No one knows what's going on with it. Oh. The, the bank, a lot of times, they won't go into the property because if it appears to be occupied, they, they have to wait out the whole six months. So people are walking away too soon. The property sits there vacant and it's not transferring hands at that time. Okay, and that's when it can get vandalized, right? Exactly. And another thing I want to mention too, before the most of the banks, before they evict you from the property, they're actually going to offer you cash for keys in which they will pay you to relocate. Um, one of the banks that I work for, they're actually offering anywhere from three to $5,000 for people to relocate because it's cheaper than them paying for an eviction. Really? Yeah. They will offer you money to relocate? Correct. Even though you, work, you know, Ex your home has been foreclosed upon? Exactly. And the benefit to the bank and, and to the owner and the neighborhood in general is that if you're, if you're evicted from that property or the property sits vacant for a long period of time, there's risk of vandalism. Well, if the bank offers you funds to relocate, you're giving the keys to the bank. They're issuing you a check at the same time. They get to take possession of the property and maintain it and secure the property. So it cuts down on the risk of vandalism. Let me see if this line actually works here. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Hi. Hi. I was listening to the show earlier with Ron Marsh, and I wanted to ask you a guess. After September 1st, since the Vatican uh, cleared up everybody's debt, nobody won't have to worry about losing their home and whether or not he's going to be able to attend that meeting that Ron Marsh is having on uh, over there on the Hill in the Seven Mile. Yes, I'm not um, familiar with, with that. I'll, I'll have to check into it a little bit more as far as what he was discussing. I didn't get to watch his entire show, but I'll um, I'll check into it, and after the show, if you want, you can give me a call. And we can yeah, I think it. he left some, Ron Marsh, some fire flyers there, so from what I understand from the show earlier, after September 1st, no one will have to worry about losing their home and mortgage and all of that stuff. The, the World Bank, the Vatican, to give uh, everybody to debt. So it might be something you want to do some research on to find out about. Okay, that sounds good. And then good. you can pass that information along to other folks that's in your, you know, that's in the real estate business. That sounds great. Thank you. Uh, thank welcome. you. And um, I think Mr. March is up in the front, so you could probably talk to him about that. Thanks a lot. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so Reginald, now once a person walks away from a house or they lose the house, tell me this, <coughs> is it possible for them to buy another house? Yes, it is. It, it depends on the circumstances. If, I mean, if they're going to apply for credit again, usually it's going to take them a minimum of three, three to five years oh. to, to be able to qualify for another mortgage. If they do a short sale, that time period is, is less, than, but it depends on their financial situation at the time. Would you talk about short sales? Pretty much. Um, 
a short sale is basically when you sell the property for its current market value versus what you owe on the mortgage. So if you owe 100000 and the current market value is 40000 you're negotiating with the bank for them to accept 40000 as a payoff. And there are some, there are some other um, requirements as well. You have to have some type of financial hardship. And um, pretty much the rest of the debt is forgiven in most cases, but the bank can give, issue a 1099-C or they can do a deficiency What is a 1099-C? Um, that's a cancellation of debt. So basically you have to pay income taxes on the difference. But with the Mortgage Debt Relief Act, um, pretty much most homeowners are forgiven altogether. So they don't have the deficiency judgment or receive a 1099-C. We have another call. Good morning. Good morning, Brenda. How are you? I'm just fine, thank you. Yeah, this is your friend Clyde. Hi. I look forward to calling in this afternoon about uh, the city election. <laughs> yeah, we'll t we'll talk a little about that. We're not going to talk the whole I do show have a about question that. About but... real estate this morning, though, for your guest. Yes. And I did hear you say um, that he is not related to you, because that was my question. Well, it, we're we're cousins. <laughs> okay, very good. Listen uh, to the guest, the young man. Very intelligent, by the way. Uh, sir, you know, every year, Wayne County, the last few years, has been doing this um, this auction of properties. And I was uh, reading online about how the Packard Building, uh, which is 35 acres, by the way, uh, it's owed uh, about a million dollars in back taxes. And the guy who owns the uh, deed is thinking about selling it to this guy from Illinois who wants to purchase it. But my uh, bigger question is, uh, is can you or have you walked through that process? Can you walk me through the process? I'm thinking about going online and you know putting on my $500 bid. I know it's uh, it's $500 if you want to bid on one property. It's 5000 if you want to bid on multiple properties, and you do get your deposit back. But other than that, can you walk me through? Do you know anything about that process on how to go about getting on properties online through Wayne County's online auction? I'll listen off air, and Brenda, thank you so much, and I look forward to you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Clyde. Yeah, pretty much. Um, actually, Wayne County has did a, a great job at um, simplifying their auction process because it's now online. Um, you know, years ago, you used to have to go down there and get a list of properties and ride around the city. So um, they're, they're, everything is online. It's pretty much automated. All the instructions are actually online. Like he said, you have to have a $500 deposit or $5,000 deposit if you're bidding on multiple properties. So you can you see the property online? Um, yeah, some, some properties are listed online. But I, I recommend two things, that you physically ride past the property and, and check the property out yourself. Also, um, order a title search. Contact the title company and have them do a title search on the property. Um, a lot of times we have people buy properties in a tax sale, and there's other liens and things on the property that they didn't in know In fact, about. I saw a story about that on the news yesterday, that someone in Highland Park, they bought the house, they put tw for 1500 I think, and they put $12,000 worth of work in it, and then they couldn't get the deed to the house. Right. There, Sometimes there's uh, title issues. Also, you want to check with the city building and safety department and make sure there's no less pendants on the property or that it's not scheduled for demolition. Because the last thing you want to do is buy a property and find out it's on a demo list. I know. You can't have the <laughs> demolition deferred and, and work something out with the city because you're going to buy the property and bring it up to code. But they have certain requirements that you have to meet. So don't avoid that process altogether because you don't want to buy a property and come and come and see it two days later and it's a it's gone <laughs> it's right. gone it's gone dorothy what happened <laughs> um question i want to ask about retail space and business right. space like on um seven mile six mile all that what is the are they going for reasonable rates there are a lot of people who want to uh buy a business or right. or get a property for business but a lot of things are involved in that not only the property insurance rates and Correct. stuff like that are there a lot of properties for sale for retail 
Yeah, there's quite a few that are available. And the rates are, have actually gone down quite a bit, even the leasing rates. Really? Um, because commercial properties have taken uh, quite a hit as well. Th the major reason for that is because a lot of small businesses, they went out of business. So you see a lot of vacancies that you, us you usually didn't have in the inner city as well as the surrounding suburbs, where properties, if it was a commercial building, an office-type building, you would have 80% of the building occupied. Now it's probably like 60% occupied. So they have to adjust to the economy as well. Wow. I was just wondering about that. What are the best types of businesses that you see, um, or people, I see a lot of beauty salons, Correct. barber shops. Right. Sometimes people set up little restaurants, but there are other kind of businesses that can be set up. What are some good businesses that you could set up in these retail spaces, you think? Um, actually, it, it varies. It just depends on the demographics of that area, you know, what the community wants. I mean, like you see Whole Foods or something like that. They just opened, and there was a demand there. So I, I think what, what we have to do is try to find something outside of the box Yes. and bring it to the community and, and kind of do some research and see what type of demand is there for it. So would you suggest leasing a space first rather than buying? Depending on the type of business that you have because owning a building can, you know, the overhead, of, of course, is quite a bit higher because then you have other insurances, you have property taxes. You're responsible for a lot more in the maintenance and upkeep versus leasing a space. If you're going to have... Um, you know, like an office setting, leasing a space may be more beneficial to you. So what if I was a first-time home buyer, I'm 25 years old, and where could I get a nice property? I don't even know how much they're running these days, but where could I get a nice property that, um, what section of the city would you entice me to invest in when I, I'm just 25, I want to buy my first home, a starter home, maybe a bungalow. Oh, wow. There's there's areas east and west side. I mean, you're talking, you know, Aiton Kelly area. You're talking west side, you know, you Aiton Evergreen. There's a number of areas in the city where you can get an inexpensive home and purchase, even if you're paying cash or getting financing. It Really, I, w I would say most people should make that decision based on, you know, their family structure, if, if the schools are good in the area, and things of that nature as well. Um, what's close by, if, if you want to stay close downtown, if you like the entertainment. Um, you know, it, it really depends. We can't really tell people where they should move or recommend that, but it has to be based on your individual needs. The Midtown area is a very popular area right now. Right. Are properties sky high? Yeah, they're increasing quite a bit. Oh, really? And, and that was a result of people coming in and saying, we're going to redevelop this area and build the demand for it. And that's, that's the thing. With most of the city, you have the blight and the vacancy. Someone has to come in with a vision and say, we're going to make this, this area what we want it to be and redevelop it at that time. And, and Do they have condominiums it. available in Midtown? Not many. <laughs> Not many? Yeah, I mean, there are some, but there's, um, again, the demand is high. So if something becomes vacant or available, it's, it's not going to be vacant or available for long. What about re uh, gentrification? Right. Like down there, Lafayette and all those streets where they used to have the low-income uh, properties, they were... I forgot the names of the homes and stuff. Mm -hmm. Are they changing those? You know, like I know around Henry Street, the people who own those apartment buildings are now wanting to take them back right. and build more luxury, uh, you know. Right. They're trying to make condos and things of that nature. That, that happens because they see an opportunity there to basically make more money, in other words. Right. And they were, the people who had them, were lower income exactly, and now they have to move they have to move or, and relocate which is in, in some cases it, it just depends on the individual some people 
would like to stay, and you have a number of people that would, would love to move from the area. It just depends on the individual. Wow, amazing. Yeah. Reginald, where is your office located? We're located at 10140 West Nine Mile in Oak Park, Michigan. And um, we're, we're just east of Coolidge. Right oh, now. one more thing before I let you go, because there's so much, there's so many questions about property. You were telling me last time that people are inquiring from out of the country about properties here. Oh, yeah. And that, that's actually been going on for at least the past five or six years. Um, we, we have actually, we have just as many investors that are out of the country, mainly from the UK, Australia. Um, is, it, it varies. I mean, Japan, they're, they're buying a the property sight unseen. What, what we see as an eyesore, they see as a good opportunity. So just like What do you think they plan to do with the properties? Pretty much a lot of them are buying the properties and holding the properties. They're buying them in bulk. Um, they're buying them and just renting the properties out, or they're fixing the properties and reselling them at a later date. Oh, so they're getting a management company to kind of run the properties and t it collect rents and so forth. Exactly. Until they decide what they're really going to do. Exactly. Amazing. What would you uh, tell a consortium, a group of friends who may want to buy some properties, where are good properties available, like apartment buildings and so forth? Pretty much all over the city. What you have to, um, if you're going to start an investment group and, and make a decision to invest in real estate, you have to see what areas are generating the most rent for your uh, money as far as your overall investment. If you buy a $10,000 property and you can rent it out for $600, or you're going to buy a $40,000 property and rent it out for $800, you have to really look at the numbers because you probably can buy four or five ten thousand dollar properties and generate more money so there's there's investment strategies that you have to sit down and consider wow so much to it Reginald what's your number again it's two four eight four four zero five two two six and he's working with people around the station here so I'd advise you to this is an honest man, I know. Not just saying because he's family, but an honest man, and he will tell you what it's about as far as um, property values are concerned and property. If you have some questions and so forth about real estate, he knows about real estate. I'd like to thank you once again. Thank you, thank you so much because you're so informative, and these are things that people need to know about. And I'll be back in just a moment with filmmaker Anthony Cuffey. Good morning. Welcome back to the Brenda Perryman Show right here on TV 33, WHPR, Comcast 20 in Detroit. And we just had Reginald Perryman on talking about property and property values. Invest, invest. One thing about it, land is good. Land can be very good. Also, remember that you can have an app on your phone right now uh, for W. HPR, it's TV 33 app. So I watch the, um, the channel everywhere I go. But I'd like to introduce you to a friend of mine who is a filmmaker, an educator, and all of that, Mr. Prolific, Anthony Cuffey. Good morning, Anthony. Good morning, good morning. Okay, so let's speak into that mic. Remember, projection is our life here. Good, good morning. Can I sing as well? Okay, I'm just kidding. Oh, I didn't know you to be a singer. Right. But anyway, Anthony, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about where you grew up and everything, and we'll get into the crux of things in just a minute. I'm, I'm an east side Detroiter, uh, born and raised, proud of it, uh, from Kirby Street on down to the Brewster Projects, uh, hanging out, kicking with my friends, growing, understanding what the city of Detroit was all about, and um, I guess everything that's tied into those experiences has brought me to where I'm at now as a filmmaker. Right, absolutely, absolutely. So where'd you go to high school? I went to Murray Wright. Oh, Murray Wright, when did you graduate? Whoa. Oh, come on, now if I say when I graduated now. <laughs> I, I graduated in the 90, I'm proud, I'm proud. Oh, that's, uh, that's yeah. good, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. My son-in-law went there, he graduated uh, after that. I mean, a little after that. But um, 
Yeah. <laughs> the Coach Duncan's son, Galen, was on last okay. week. Uh okay. huh. Ricky. He How's he doing? Oh, he's senior p development um, of the Lions. Is he's he? the one. Mm -hmm. oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Okay. He's doing very well. But anyway, so after you uh, went to high school, you graduated, you went to college. I went to Ferris State. I'm a bulldog. And, um, Ferris I'm State. Ferris State University in Big Rapids, Michigan, which uh, was a, a big change for me coming from the hood, as you would say, um, growing up upper. Michigan, uh, it was a definite big change for me. Yeah, but you you relished the change, didn't you? I did. It it, it gave me a diverse outlook on life. You know, I, sometimes I think exposure is the biggest key, and when you're trying to change a kid from the inner city, on on up into his uh his upper years in life. Well, you know, as black people, many times we live in two worlds. Yeah, yeah. We live in two worlds, yeah. and it's best to learn about all the, the worlds. All the worlds. Yeah. Okay, it's really good to do that because you have to deal with different people, especially in the professions that you choose to be in. Correct? Absolutely, absolutely. So after college, what what you do? After college, I went to corporate America, um, and and there I realized how much I hated um, corporate America. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> it's a different uh, kind of thing. It, it, you got to think in a box. It's in a box, and it was certainly. Um, it didn't mesh in with me. In fact, I was asked to kind of change how I talk, and I did, and for a minute. And um, how 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 were you supposed to speak? Well, th you know, um, I went from talking how I talk to hey, absolutely, oh, that was awesome. You know, oh, really? Uh, oh man. Oh, oh man. yeah, it was great. Uh huh. And realized it was taking so much from me. Oh my People goodness. People didn't realize who I was, and they were calling me, and even my mother. And uh, I, I couldn't do it anymore. So I, I hate to even walk in the bank because the smell reminds me of, of a corporate setting. And then what did you do? After it, you know, uh, all through my years in, in high school, the, the college, um, co uh, I would say school was a challenge, not necessarily from an academic standpoint, but from a focus standpoint. Absolutely. My I mind was constantly You wandering. are my brother. <laughs> you are my brother. What, what's your sign? I'm a Virgo. Oh, yeah, birthday coming up soon. Yeah, I was getting ready to say yep. soon. Yep, yep. Uh -huh. And so um, my, my teachers will always say, you're a writer. You're a good writer. I didn't understand that. I even had a college teacher, professor, tell me I was a good writer. And you coming from the hood. You, you, it's only two people that make it off the hood, either a drug dealer or an athlete. So, you know, I tried the athletic thing, and that didn't work out for me. <laughs> What and was your sport of choice? I, I thought basketball was, but it wasn't. <laughs> as it is, I mean, you know, for a lot of inner city kids, that's, that's our goal. But it didn't happen for me. And so the realizations, um, and particularly in college, um, my mind would always often wonder. Uh, people thought I was a little different. And it, it came from me just, my head was constantly just wondering. And I would think of the craziest things and, and redo the world and concepts and ideas and I would come up with just all kind of imaginative things and so um, I didn't understand that. Did that you have any encouragement pathway. from home to explore those things? I, I, no, I don't think people really understood it. They thought I was a comedian. They understand it later. Later, don't yeah, I believe so. I believe so. And so, um, <coughs> you know, I went in and decided to write a book and uh, I wrote Retrace, which is an awesome, awesome fiction novel. If you don't have it, make sure you get Retrace. it. Retrace. Where could we get you Retrace? You can get it. Um, you can get it on Amazon. If if it's not on a local shelf, they can order it. And that book actually made it out to Hollywood. Right, right. Why don't you tell us about that? First and foremost, give them the basic plot of Retrace. I know what it is, but you. Re Retrace is uh, is is. Uh, it's about a young lady who was born as a result of rape, and, and as a result of it, never understood the concept of love. So when she finds or meets this young man who falls in love with her, uh, her world entangled encompasses his, and it's just a real dope urban romance novel. Yeah. Uh, do we do we have? Oh, we don't have that one today. No. no. But. Um, so that one, I, I've seen trailers from that. But that trailer, the, the, the initial trailer that's out on the Internet is not the, the trailer. Trailer it was something that we did years ago, and it was really 
from an investment standpoint because it did gather some interest from from Hollywood. Um, uh, it landed, I think, in the lap of uh, uh, John Singleton. At the time, uh, he wasn't interested in banking another book. He wanted the script, and I hadn't had the script completed. So I think I was like a quarter of a way done. And by the time I actually completed it, um, our connections with him had dissipated. So um, that fell through. But then I, I got calls. Uh, I actually put some calls in to uh, MJ, MJE, Maggie Johnson Enterprises, and uh, his son Andre at the time who was responsible, who was over the, the film part, contacted me. And um, I dropped off a package from to them guys in L.A., and I, I didn't I didn't hear anything from that. And so I, I started second-guessing myself. And then when I did finally complete the script, uh, when I was in Hollywood, I, I met with um, some guys, a guy named Mike Hubbard from, uh, I think, Brightest Ideas, Brightest Entertainment, Br Brightest Idea Entertainment. They did a movie with uh, Jada Pinkett and um, a couple movies with Martin Lawrence. And um, there was some interest there. So he told, he asked me, um, at the time I was trying to talk and sell a movie that you were in uh, that we did, a, a Solemn Trance, by the way. We'll talk about that uh, later on. But uh, they were more interested in Retrace. Mm -hmm. And so Retrace, um, when I got home, I sent the script. I was just excited. And so I was overzealous. I called them immediately. <laughs> and and uh, the person who gives the approval for their scripts, uh, she was like, well, that's not how the process goes. And so I, I learned quickly that uh, being overzealous can smack you in the face. So um, I called them. Uh, I didn't. I waited. Um, they finally uh, responded. She called and she said she absolutely loved the script, which to me was like, whoa, I got the approval of some Hollywood ears, and that, that was kind of dope. Right, right. You know, there's a saying. Well, it's not really a saying, but my son told me this. He said if he would have only played basketball in his backyard, he never would have known how good he was. Mm. And you, by you sending it out and putting it out there, mm -hmm. you saw then that I can do this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> and you write your scripts. Mm -hmm. And you have some very original ideas. And um, five loaves, of, is it five loaves? Five loaves of bread. Five loaves of bread is another film that you. I, I co-wrote that. The <laughs> idea actually came from uh, one of my boys. His name Marvin Muhammad. Shout out to Marv. He's a very talented writer. Um, in fact, I plan on doing another project with him eventually because um, I just think, you know, I, I like uh, when I believe in someone, I like to feed into it, and I think he's a talent. But um, yeah, Five Loaves of Bread is a uh, it's it's actually a healthcare conspiracy. Um, a healthcare conspiracy. It, yeah, it's, it's 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 a family um, from Africa who who has the cure for cancer, and the government's trying to seize the cure. And do we have a we we yeah, have we a trailer from that? We do have a trailer. Okay, well, as soon as we could get the trailer on. Code bread man's in effect, gentlemen. I don't trust it, all right? I just don't. Go to your family's bakery right now. See, the affiliates and the government are one entity. I heard that people come from all over the world to purchase your bread. Who are you? Do you have the recipes? The measure of a true man's heart. Selfless. Dad wanted to mass produce your family's bread. Free for everyone. And that bread cures cancer. You expected my call. Very suspenseful, very suspenseful. And uh, you filmed that right here in Detroit. Yeah, that's, that's with zero dollars. Um, that's, that's an old, we, we, no one shoots on standard death anymore, but that particular film was, was shot on standard death. Um, what is standard death? It's just a, uh, it, it doesn't have the, the, the quality of, of imagery that you would normally see in high death. So um, 
it, it just is more pixelated, pixelated than you would normally see nowadays with uh, using DSLRs and the red camera and things. Right, like that right, nature. right. So did you you finish this? Uh, did you finish it? Yeah, this project is is finished. Right now, it's still a little mixing that's going on, but it is finished. Uh, we probably have a small premiere before we send it to some some film festivals. Um, the objective right now is just building towards um, the bigger project. Um, you know, when Hollywood first got a, a buzz of Anthony Cuffey, I guess you can call it Hollywood. I'm still <laughs> fighting for this thing. But um, uh, it was more from a writing perspective. And uh, a friend of mine at the time, Loon, his uh, name is Loon, he used to be a rapper, uh, Bad Boy. Um, um, Loon, you know, with the New York accent, he used to be like, yo, yo, aunt, man, you're you going to have to build your discography up, man, so we can get, get your talents out there. They need to see that. <laughs> So he kind of initiated me jumping right into directing. I was trying to build towards it, but um, I decided to jump right into it so that I could eventually go to someone's negotiating table as a writer and director and not just selling the rights to a project. Well, let's talk about a solemn trance. Why don't you tell the audience the uh, plot of that. Uh, Solemn Trance is, 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 is a beautiful story. Um, it was crazy as Miss Perryman is, is, is who is this a phenom in the city of Detroit. She casted the, the, uh, the project, the movie. It's a full feature. And uh, she also had an acting role in it. And um, she did a marvelous, marvelous uh, uh, job. I, I hope am that we so can come mean. back and premiere that. Yes. <laughs> we'll premiere it. Yes. But yeah, um, it's a film. It's about it's an AIDS project, and um, it's it's about a young lady who who gets involved, has a one night stand, and um, after a situation w with her ex husband, and she ends up uh, with HIV. But the issue is she doesn't really know who where she, where who she, she got, got it, it. Mm -hmm. and at the same time, as we get more involved in her story, um, it's not quite certain if she's the one that's no longer not really a victim she may be the um the person that's spreading the disease so it's a, it's a real uh, dramatic piece um i think it, it has a a wonderful theme a wonderful message behind it um and i can't wait to to, to this uh, and it has out. some good actresses in it jessica care moore is in it janine is in it janine um from fabu fabu janine williams w right um just a number of it's people. A, yeah, number of Gloria people. Ridgeway. Gloria Ridgeway from the Ridgeway <laughs> Sisters. Ridgeway uh, Sisters, uh, a friend of mine. She's in it. Um, some really good people are in it. Paul Dean, who you've seen in so many different movies right. in the local area. Right. Yep. Right. And I think I can't wait till it comes out because it does have um, some thing, uh, a good theme and then some sub stuff mm -hmm. going on with the younger people mm -hmm. in it. So it's good, and it, it does have some morals to it. Absolutely, and, and it's crazy um, dealing with the subject matter. Philo's is dealing with cancer, and the Solomon Trans is dealing with AIDS. It's, it's just uh, problematic See, we have so many stories. We have so many stories, and that's my thing. I think that we need to tell those other stories Absolutely. instead of the same. I see a lot of the same, same stuff. Story. Right, 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 right. In fact, the the, uh, the next project that we're working on, and this one um, we're praying is a, is a pretty pretty nice budget. Um, pray with us on that. It's a romance novel, and um, it, it was it is more in the the genre of a, a Will Ferrell. If you know any uh, Will Ferrell Ferrell's work, I'm a, I'm a fan. Right, right. Anchorman. It's a little different, yeah. So it's a little different from what you would consider or you normally see from a black right. Well, th it's good. It's good because you want mass appeal. Absolutely. You really want mass appeal. Now, Anthony, what spurred this interest in film? I've been loving movies since the beginning. Um, I think entertainment has always been in my blood. When I was young, uh, I remember my uncle who, who dated Val Benson, who was a, a renowned playwright at the time. She was ex-wife of uh, one of the four tops right and, and, yep, yep. and she she had a play and uh, i was probably about six or seven years old when i went and man it inspired me something crazy so I, after we seen the play i went back home and rewrote her whole play <laughs> and uh i never you did i rewrote the whole play at that age and i didn't really understand it but 
it was never pushed, and so I kind of left it, and it was somewhat dormant. And then at the same, um, right after that, I, I danced a little bit. We danced a little on the scene. Uh, we did a uh, we used to, we was we were recruited by Moses from the scene to do Thriller around the city of Detroit and um, oh wow I actually seen a, a snippet of it on YouTube when we were on the scene uh, it was doing Halloween and it's it's a funny I look like my middle my my, my middle son um, it's hilarious I I, th- I remember in a moment I thought I was killing it when oh. I saw it I, I realized how terrible it was terrible the scene it wasn't I the was. new dance show no I was you know I'm old so no <laughs> you're not old oh, yeah okay. <laughs> Okay. So yeah, it was the, it was the scene with Nat Morris. I know, sugar, sugar, salt, and salt. And then get off today. <laughs> so yeah. Well, where do you see yourself in five years? Ah oh, man. Um, first off, I, I, my objective, honestly, uh, of course, uh, I want to uh, make money on this full time. Uh, and, and we haven't had that opportunity yet, but that is the plight. Well, that it's comes. It's that coming. It's coming. And right now we're on a, on a grind of, of pushing the Anthony Cuffey brand. I'm here now with my publicist, uh, Fred Carlton Peoples, who's, who's helping out in that area. Um, I didn't know it was Fred. I know it was F. Fred Car- no. Carlton. <laughs> <laughs> he just F, F, I'm sorry. Yeah. Did F I give it away? Car- <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, Fred. But, um, um, uh, in five years, you know, I'm I'm looking to be in the running for a gr- for a Grammy. A Grammy, I mean, an Oscar. I, 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 let me let me say an Oscar, but Grammy is a slip because I I'm all, I did we do music as well. I know, so I'm sorry. I know, you but do. yeah, certainly an Oscar. Wow, you know, and that can happen because yeah, one of my pray. students was nominated for an Oscar last year. Wow, one of my wow. former students, acting students, well, was I mean, nominated. You have a plethora uh, of students. Man, Every I time know. I go out, they mention, "Hey, I know. Do you know Miss Perriman?" Anyway, so yeah, yeah. No, but he it. was able to take some money and make a short film. Okay, and he was one of the five nominees right, for right, short right. film and they interviewed him a lot and he um on national television they did not win but well, well he won a lot of film festivals right but he was nominated oh yeah and he, awesome. you know to see him standing up there on the with the oscar class right, and right. steven spielberg standing right That's behind crazy. him and everything That's this crazy. is something that can be done absolutely so it's nothing wrong. You know, sometimes people try to shoot down creativity, mm-hmm. but creativity is so important. It's, 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 it's phenomenal. It's, it's awesome. I mean, think about it. You're, you're doing something. You're taking, you're making something completely out of nothing. It's not a technical aspect. It's, it's imagery, and it's something that, that deals with every, I mean, the mind is so creative. And when you take someone who's creative, they're so in depth and knowledgeable in so many different areas. It's unreal. So when I meet a talent or another uh, another inspiring talent, just the the mind is, is is ridiculous. And part of it is encouragement because with you and with myself, my mother, they weren't all into what I was doing. Yeah, yeah. But finally, they they came around and mm-hmm. they saw that that's something that was your passion. Mm-hmm something that was my passion and they kind of got on board right there because we as black people tend to think that it's so hard in the creative arts to be successful mm-hmm. you know and we don't push our children towards it a lot of times and you have to push your kids towards their passion i mean that's probably um, i'm not going to say probably i'm sure that's the purpose of their life and when you're not connecting them to what their purpose is uh they end up leaving here um, empty empty and doing a job they don't they, like they doing. don't like doing and um, I believe race. that the things that you find that are your passion when you're young if you could keep that going it can work for oh, you absolutely um, in so many different areas I, I, I know in the entertainment world so many people want to get involved in it but you have to you, you have to be um, wise um, and no, no matter how much I love singing, I can't sing. So uh, I have to realize, I had to realize what my gift and my talents were and pursue it. So everyone is not going to be a writer. Everyone is not going to be a director. But you might be you might be an agent. You might be a publicist. You might, in some aspect of entertainment, there's an aspect for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And sometimes, well, just for example, poetry. 
Richard did poetry this morning on his show, and I'm a poet. I, ha I have three books of poetry out. My fourth book is coming out in a few weeks. But it was just poetry. Mm -hmm. But this poetry and performing the poetry has taken me all over this country right. on corporate tours. That's why I know about corporate. Lord have mercy. <laughs> That's something different. But had me speaking and performing the mm -hmm. poetry. Nobody ever thought, and I'll never forget, when I was in college, I just liked poetry. And, I, and one day I came to my dorm room and they said, uh, uh, words, words, stay out, mm -hmm. keep out. You know, people tease me about it. Right, right, right. And right. then it started working for me and I started getting paid for it. And you just got to stick with it. Sometimes right. everybody's not going to see your vision. Mm -hmm. And you have a beautiful wife and beautiful sons and thank everything you, who they're, they're into what you're doing. Yeah, and I mean, it's been a big sacrifice for them because my time is <coughs> it's not typical. I'm constantly busy, um, which is a good thing sometimes, but uh, it can be very stressful as well. But you've taught, too. I'm, I'm in education, so I do have a 9 to 5 again because I'm, I'm not doing, a, you know, I'm not getting paid full time for this. It's, st uh, it's still a grind for me. So um, that's why I'm so tied up and busy all the time. But, yeah, absolutely. S and shout out to all my, my students in the city. From what all school? the schools I participated, from uh, Life Skills to uh, Southeastern and uh, South e Southeastern High School. So uh, wonderful, wonderful family there. Uh, I'm just happy to be a part of, of the educational process in the city of Detroit. Oh, Southeastern. Yeah. I'm very interested in Southeastern High School. I, I'm very interested uh, you in You got to come visit. Well, I've been over there. I mean, I took my students over there, and they performed uh, okay. some years ago. But I'm just interested in some of the things that I've heard about it and so forth. What do you think? Th are the Detroit public schools getting better? Uh, I believe so. I, I think right now uh, there's a mirror in front of it, and it's, it's, it's forcing the city to actually look at what we've done. I know when I was a student, education was, was top-notch in the city of Detroit, and then it, it took a dramatic fall. And as a result of it, um, I, I think more politics got in the way more so than anything. Right now, there's a, mi a mirror in front of it, which is causing uh, change to take place. So I think it's headed in the right direction. Two quick questions about that, I, I, and I didn't mean to get off on that, but do you think that school board members should actually come into it knowing something about education? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I mean, I have issues with the fact I, I that so, so many school board members, they really don't know. To have some some connection in some form with education, just to understand the, the process and the trends. I mean, things have changed so much. Um, to I think some necessity. people use it as a stepping stone. Well, I think in life, a lot of people use a lot of things as stepping stones. So I, I don't think it's any different than life in itself. Because uh, I see some of the decisions that have been made mm -hmm. and everything, and I said, how did they make that decision? How do they know how children learn? Mm -hmm. I, you know, children learn in different ways. And so you have to be multifaceted mm -hmm. as an instructor. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. And It's a challenge. And you've made some videos with your young people, right? Yeah, uh, we, I try to use their gifts and talent to, um, to exploit. I think entertainment is a good way to, to preach education and Absolutely. to teach, um, especially in today's generation, so it's important. Well, it's a visual society. Absolutely. So. And peers can teach peers, and my time is up. Oh, my God. My time is up, and I don't want to go too far and we'd be cut off cable and everything. Right, right. Mr. Cuffey. When you're going to bring a solemn trance back? Uh, well, as soon as it's done, I'm, uh, I will, I'm sure uh, Mr. Carlton will give you a phone call. Oh, of course, of and, course. Um, I, I just want to say also, Retrace, uh, we did produce a soundtrack for that, too, along with my music partner, uh, Wimani Page, um, who's a phenomenal uh, vocalist and producer as well. So you'll be hearing more from that. Oh, okay. Well, show. we'll be ready. I'll come back to uh, the show. Thank you. Oh, well, my pleasure. Everybody, this has been wonderful. See you again on uh, Table Talk uh, this afternoon, uh, and I'd like to thank. Can, can I tell them about? They can reach me on Facebook. Oh yes, at Anthony Cuffey. Uh, you can reach me email wise a n t that's Ant Cuffey c u f f as in Fred Fred i e at yahoo dot com. Uh, please give me a call if you have any questions. Fred. Concerns. 
Have a blessed one. Okay, and I will see you this afternoon on Table Talk, and you know there's a lot to bring to the table today. See you later, and see you next Friday. Where I have.